are one of the most fearsome, savage, insidious, and most well-established races in the 41st millennium. They lack any empathy even toward their own race, and they exist as a genetically engineered creation of instinct and a DNA-coded sense of purpose. They are created for one task and one collective goal only, to wage unending war. The Orcs are one of the older races in the 41st millennium, along with the Eldar, being created by the Old Ones. The then Krok would later become what are now known as the Race of Orcs. The Eldar were a higher form of design with them possessing many levels of high intelligence. The Orcs are their exact opposite, working on pure genetic instinct. Orcs and greenskins in general though are not born from sexual reproduction, they're rather grown from spores. And all orcs are grown from these same spores and fungus, be they lowly snotlings and gretchen or full-blown orc warriors. Once a planet becomes infected with orc fungus, either by chance or invasion, it'll likely never be free again, having to forever defend against the unrelenting green menace. This infection is often likened to something like a terminal disease. Once a world is contaminated, it will surely be a case of when, not if, it will eventually wither and die. Orcs are enemies to all throughout the galaxy, but despite their crude and instinctive driven nature, they should never be underestimated. Defence to an orc assault can seem almost hopeless from the outset for some human worlds. With all their strength and power that they can wield, to fight the orcs is nothing other than a battle of attrition, a slow grinding down of morale and willpower. For a successful defence against any assault from the Greenskins only buoys their spirits and emboldens them further to attack again with more fury and more enthusiasm. They won't relent, they won't slow or surrender. There is no respite, there is no escape. A planet infected by the Orc menace is a doomed world. Orcs possess a powerful genetic sense of being to fight, to conquer and to never surrender under any circumstances. Their strategies, if you could call them that, are usually unsurprisingly simple and unashamedly direct. To overwhelm the enemy with sheer weight of numbers or absolute weapon superiority, to never show their enemies mercy, to smash and obliterate all who oppose them under an unrelenting green tide of ultra-violence. They wage war with machines that defy logic and technical understanding, and they care little for strategic gain, are seen to be just as likely to slaughter one another as they are the enemy. But most especially if an enemy is in their sights. Orcs are often reported to, for example, skewer one another with swords and other melee weapons just so as to gain a killing blow to an opponent crush their kin with their own vehicles with little if any regard and use heavy weaponry without thought to such a thing as friendly casualties. Imperial forces are often left to wonder how does one battle an enemy that defies all logic? And their answer is usually exterminatus. The Orcs, as mentioned previously, are an engineered species. They were created some 60 million years ago by the Old Ones, who also created the Eldar and seeded life across the galaxy. The Orcs were created, as were the Eldar, to wage war against the Necrons, the ancient enemy of the Old Ones. And the Orcs would refer to their creators as the Brain Boys. Now, while the Eldar were made to be highly intelligent with extremely powerful psychic powers so as to best counter the Necron and Khtan threat, the Orcs, then Krok, however, were the antithesis of the Eldar. Muscle-bound, irrationally aggressive, and rarely showing signs of advanced intelligence. They're driven by designed instinct. Orcs, you see, require war and brutality 
as others might need food and water to sustain them. To an orc, war and brutal savagery is not a desire, it's a physical requirement to their identity. And this is why they often fight amongst themselves as much as they would any outside races. While they do possess advanced tech, it is maintained by a class known as Odd Boys, who, as with all other orcs, are driven more by just a gut feeling, a born knowledge, than a true awareness of what they're actually doing. Unlike the Imperium of the 41st millennium, the Odd Boys possess the instinct of skill to not only maintain, but more importantly, to actually develop technology, if you can really call it such. This skill isn't learned or researched by any conventional sense of tech development, it's instead bound into their genetics. As with all things Orc, most of their skills are instinctive. The best way to really envisage this is for them to just smash things together until by some miracle it just works. A kind of deadly galactic scrap heap challenge if you will. Orcs don't possess any random evolutionary psychic powers as humans might, and say, you know, evolutionary, if it's the old ones which have seeded life, perhaps it's by design, but nonetheless, the psychic power with orcs is comically random, and again, being by design from their creators, the old ones, this bizarre psychic power allows for orcs to literally will something to be true, that if just enough of them believe it, then it will be so. For example, the classic painting their war machines a certain colour may imbue it with a power, like being more powerful with explosives or just to go faster. Just because enough orcs will believe it to be so, with the proximity of numbers of them, means it will become a reality. This enables orcs to achieve things like space travel, even controlling space hulks and bringing them into real space under orc modified control, a terrifying thought as well as bringing huge war machines to a battlefield. All of these things by all rational logic should be outside their realm of skill and possibility. And this genetic trait is also why orc technology, whilst essentially being just a random collection of things smashed together, will become devastatingly fearsome war machines in the hands of orcs. But then would just as easily return to being useless junk in the hands of other races. It's a clever solution to the threat of your war gear falling into the hands of an enemy, and again, this is by design of the old ones. Conversely though, if orc numbers dwindle, then it can be potentially counterproductive. Unlike other races who can wield immense power reliably, even in singular or small numbers, any number of examples would suit from, say, Imperial Assassins to Grey Knights and Eldar Wraith Knights. The more or less of their own race will not have a bearing on their success, their strength or their functionality of their tech. Not so much with the Orcs. The awareness of this Orc psychic functionality came into general understanding through the Imperium of Man's tech priests, who through their own cultivated belief in a machine spirit that inhabits technology and that this machine spirit serves mankind at the command of the machine god. This imbued them with a perspective and point of reference that enabled them to see the truth of how orcs were able to bring technology to the fore that should have been far out of their reach. Lastly, the orc race's anatomy is particularly interesting. The old ones obviously wanted the orcs or croc to be functional as a warrior race, a biological war machine. But before you have the ability to wage war, you still have to fulfill any life form's basic needs, like sustenance, food, water, the basics of life. The old ones in their wisdom imbued the orcs with a powerful genetic advantage here on top of their already many powerful genetic traits. For one, when it comes to food and liquid intake, the orcs can use their own growing fungus as a food source. They'll happily eat pretty much anything though when it comes to meat and the lower orc forms of snotlings will cultivate this fungus food. The more interesting elements of their biology though is that orcs really are something like a symbiotic animal-fungus hybrid, making them partly eukaryotic in nature. Now fungus was historically part of the plant kingdom, but fungi lack chlorophyll, the green pigment in plants that converts light energy to chemical energy. They also have other distinct structural and physiological features and are so classed separately from plants. Now, it has been suggested that orcs' green skin and their blood could directly contain chlorophyll, 
so as to allow orcs to actually photosynthesize as a plant does and thereby provide orcs with some energy so they can survive longer without actual food. Now, the only problem, this makes absolutely no sense for the reasons that I just mentioned. Fungi don't have chlorophyll. So if orcs grow and were cultivated as a plant-based life form, in part, this would actually be more reasonable. But they're not. They're grown from fungi. So apparently the generator Magos biologists of the Imperium should actually do some more microscopic comparisons before they reach their conclusions. However, it's also suggested that orcs in their blood and bodies may contain some sort of algae, and that this might be actually what's responsible for the coloration and then also possibly the ability to photosynthesize to a degree. This is a more reasonable concept, but as with all alien races, information is pretty scarce and speculation is abound. So this one point aside, other orc anatomical interests are that an orc's animal fungal symbiosis means that they actually contain less critical organs than say a human, meaning orcs can afford to take wounds and damage that actually might kill a lesser creature, but it will allow them to continue functioning. Part of the reason they are so surely haphazard when in battle, almost careless, is their bodies are essentially designed to be simple, practical, and operate even when catastrophically damaged. Which rings true of everything we know about their purpose and their design. They were designed to be a biological war machine and nothing more. Orc growth though is a strange thing, whereby orcs will grow according to, I suppose, unsurprisingly, how violent they are. They'll generally continue to grow at a varying rate dependent on how successful they are in combat, be that versus other orcs or their enemies, and then their growth will stagnate again. Orcs live across a wide and scattered number of worlds throughout the galaxy, some in a state of war, some in endless skirmishes, and some dominating worlds ruling them as overlords, with often human slaves obeying their brutal command. The orc's expansion was really an accident, as best known in orc history. Of course it was. This is why even now their settlements are often random with no real pattern, focus, or direction. The Eldar claim orcs have become part of reality itself. Mankind, as well, scouted, probed the galaxy, all of the known galaxy, and everywhere that they explored, they found the Orc. The galaxy at this point is contaminated beyond any hopes of cleansing and salvaging it from the Orc. Because of the random and haphazard fashion by which Orcs discover, explore, and inhabit the galaxy, they have splintered into various communities, if you want to call them that. These communities are usually just a confederacy of tribes, either loosely or under a warlord. Each tribe is a random bunch of orcs just smashed together with clans and various mechs and materials. It's a mishmash of violence and constructivity. It's best not to overthink it. It bears no resemblance to any ordered sense of a community or a society. Orcs have known of mankind and their emperor for some time. They know that humans worship the Emperor and have seen his shrines and symbols across human society. They regard the Emperor as the god of the humans. And this is easy for orcs to understand as they have their own gods. Even though they see humans as weak, they do respect the Emperor as a powerful war god. From the orc point of view, the Emperor is a constant warlord to the humans. They see him everywhere in human society, and so do the orcs. This widespread war god must surely be powerful, and therefore to be respected. Some orcs speak of a legend where the Emperor would appear as a manifestation challenging the orc gods to battle. But still, despite this, he's also seen to the orcs as a confusing figure. Why he would command his human servants to take on so many pointless tasks when they could be just fighting makes no sense to the orcs. The humans' constant failures or their stress and despair seems to underline this confusion for orcs, hence why they often use the word uman as a slang for things that are pointless, impractical, or just counterproductive. The orcs' attitude to life is fairly simple, and therefore they cope with the realities of the universe far better than many other races. With no overarching goals and day-to-day -day concerns being really only whether to build or fight or eat, it's quite a stress-free life especially when you have no fear of your own mortality, from an orc's point of view. Generally speaking, they don't try to influence their own destiny, they don't try to apportion blame, unless it's some stupid Gretchen looking to get his head bashed in. 
Their hatred is spread equal among their enemies and their allies, and if they fail, they feel no guilt, try again in a different way. Unlike humanity, Chaos has little to any fear or effect with orcs. Their minds are hardwired to their simple day-to-day -day activities, so dreams of power and turning against each other for some cause is not something that's likely to spread very insidiously through a tribe of orcs. They're probably too busy already killing each other over some far more trivial matter. And because of their simple and objectively speaking stress-free lifestyle, it leaves little psychic stress by which chaos can actually invade them. Also, even though some races may look upon the orcs as evil, either due to their near mindless savagery or their endless conquest of worlds, this is actually a pretty ignorant perspective. Lumping orcs in alongside dark forces like Chaos or Dark Elder is really a disservice to the orcs because they exist by design and they have become simply very effective at existing. They follow their instincts and these are hard coded into their very being. Evil? I don't think so but brutally savage, definitely. It's also often mistaken that perhaps if one were to see Chaos and Orc fighting on the same battlefield that they are somehow an alliance. In reality, it's probably more simply that the Orcs just see them as other fighters on the field who they'll probably turn to deal with in short order once the nearer enemy to them has been battered into submission. And when it comes to trade, Orcs strangely do have this as part of their culture, and they use their teeth, literally their teeth. It's actually a comically natural solution to economic inflation, because Orcs go through their teeth similarly to something like a shark. They replace and regrow them frequently. Orc teeth also degrade over time, so it's impossible to stockpile them. This keeps prices in Orc trading constant, and ensures that all Orcs have access to regular currency and commodities. And besides, if you're running short on teeth, it's no problem, you can just go smash some other orc's face in and get yourself some more. Orc language is deemed as being low gothic, and orcs are able to communicate with others, but at a very basic level. Orc script, though, is very different altogether, and it's actually written in glyphs. The core of this is simple clan indicators, and these are then adapted using phonetic symbols which can form some of the key orc words. It's pretty simple though because it's just generally not needed by the orc race. They function by design, not structure or organisation. They have no need to keep records, log data or any other useful societal function for writing and literature. These aren't important for orcs. The orc way is one of near anarchy. They're ruled by traditions and understandings much more than laws and governing. And it's pretty simple. Orc society is about conflict. Strong orcs will rise up, weak ones will work or are killed, and they in turn benefit from the leadership of the stronger orcs. If an orc tribe is beaten by a stronger one, the survivors gain the leadership of a better tribe, making them stronger. And there's no rules about a tribe's size, location or purpose. It's just the rough grouping of orcs in a given area at a given time and each is led by a warlord whose authority is pretty loose, giving just maybe enough rule to prevent all the orcs from turning on each other. A tribe could be a few hundred strong, a few million. The literal numbers are not important. Large tribes are usually split into smaller groups of warbands which are ruled by war bosses. And these warbands are usually a few hundred strong, creating smaller forces ready to battle wherever it's necessary, or whenever they feel like it. While orcs will belong to a tribe, they also will belong to a clan. Now a tribe may break apart into parts or form new ones, but clans are enduring and remain a reasonable constant from an orc point of view. Some of the most noted orc clans are as follows. Now the Bad Moons, these are some of the most wealthy orcs. They're essentially what could be regarded as the merchant caste in orc society. The Blood Axes were the first orc clan to encounter the Imperium of Man, and they adopted human tactics of camouflage, albeit slightly bright camouflage. And usually for orcs, they'll sometimes actually retreat, having picked this up also from humans, but they'll usually return, and in greater numbers. This clan will sometimes even trade with humans, even having been known to work as mercenaries for them, which sounds crazy, but maybe uncomfortably necessary. The Death Skulls are essentially looters and scavengers. They appropriate battlefield loot to make themselves stronger, including Imperial War Gear. The Evil Sons are orcs who are committed to speed and whatever makes them go fast should be as loud as possible. They also love flying vehicles like fighters, fighter bombers, and they usually seem to wear at least some red material, because as all orcs do know, red ones go faster. 
Goths. The Goths are simply tough orcs. They're the biggest, the most brutal, they thrive on battle more so than others, and they're driven by the blood fury of close quarter battle. Snake bites worship ancient traditions over advanced tech. They protect themselves with war paint and may even choose to remain as feral orcs instead of developing their skills with mechs and guns. Finally, the freebooters. These are the pirates. These orcs are notorious thieves, preying upon anything or anyone that they find. They'll kill anybody they see, they'll seize upon, haul their booty back to their hidden bases. So now we go to orc religion. Whether intentional or not, the old ones ended up imbuing the orc with a religious sensibility. They worship their two gods, Gork and Mork. One is brutal and cunning, and the other is cunning and brutal. The orc gods are the center of orc energy. They drive and power their whole culture. The best idea we have of how the orcs perceive their gods is in their mechs. These are the physical manifestation of their orc gods and drive their followers into stupefying frenzies of violence and bloodlust. They're also seen in armoured battle suits Gorkonaut and Morknaut. These armoured suits are seen as idols and the orcs piloting these suits gripped with visions of their gods urging them to fight on harder, faster, more brutally and inevitably to meet their demise on the battlefield. While orcs often talk of Gork and Mork as separate entities, it's even possible they are one perhaps with two sides or provide different visions to different orcs. Still, it doesn't stop the orcs from often favouring one or the other being known as either Gorkers or Morkers. One figure in the Imperium knows more of Gork and Mork than most others. He is Vulcan, the Primarch of the Salamanders. He is what's known as a Perpetual in the 40k universe. Essentially, he's an immortal. He can regenerate from almost any injury, even something like being vaporised. Vulcan disappeared after the Horus Heresy, but he would appear some 1500 years later on the Imperial world of Caldera to aid in defending it against a massive orc invasion. Now, though he died many times over, he would regenerate and appear again on the front lines. The Imperial Inquisition requested he lead a mission to destroy the orc warboss known as the Beast, but Vulcan refused until Caldera was saved. With the aid of Imperial forces, Vulcan saved Caldera from destruction and would return to Terra, gathering an Imperial force to Ulanor to the homeworld of the Beast. Vulcan would lead the final charge into the beast's massive temple gargant, confronting the warboss there. During a powerful struggle, the Primarch and the warboss would fall into the gargant's power generator, and Vulcan created the detonation in the generator so powerful it killed not only the beast, but a massive chain reaction, shattering the temple gargant and obliterating them. Vulcan presumed dead by the Imperium, but the Salamander Space Marines still hunt for him, believing him indestructible and that he will return to them. And the point of this story was what Vulcan would witness in the heart of the Orc Gargant when exposed to its powerful generator. He witnessed the raw energy that was the culmination of all the Orc's warg, and he would witness the origins of the Orcs and their gods Gork and Mork battling one another at the beginning of time. This powerful vision allowed Vulcan to understand the true nature of the Orcs, how they are a race of evolution through experimental anarchy. Now, the Orcs have been an ever-existing threat to the Imperium of Man, but towards the end of the 41st millennium, there's been seen an explosion in Orc Warg. Now, the Orc Dominion, or Empire, marks the regions in the galaxy currently controlled by the Xenos. Some planets are now completely controlled by the Orc race, where others are in an unending state of brutal, nightmarish, and near-hopeless war. Orcs have been heard to keep under control some of the local populace, creating a prison workforce who are kept in unbearable, exhausting and dangerous conditions, abiding by their uncaring savage slave masters. Most of these prisoners will be unlikely to ever know any other life than being subject now to the Orcs' brutal will. But the Orcs will at any time also control random isolated worlds, as well as rampaging hordes that sweep through the galaxy, battling all that they encounter. They also have been found inhabiting ancient space hulks. Now as an aside, a space hulk is simply a term given by the Imperium of Man to any ancient wrecks 
of space vessels. These hulks are no mere freighters or even warships, but giant ancient vessels, possibly from the early exploration of mankind or even lost in the Age of Strife. They can be so massive as to even maintain their own gravity, or in rare cases, atmosphere. The hulks can often appear and disappear, transitioning between the warp and normal space. This makes exploring them extremely dangerous. As well as orcs, they often can host other dangers like the vile Xenos Tyranids, who have been found often using these hulks as breeding grounds for their gene stealers. Even Chaos Space Marines can sometimes be found there, either searching for ancient tech or preparing to launch hidden attacks against the Imperium. While there is great potential reward in searching a space hulk, there is also immense danger, coupled with the ambient danger of the own hulk's instability. As such, searching these vessels is left to the elite warriors of the Imperium and the Space Marines, the Space Marine Terminators. They are some of the most heavily armoured units within a Space Marine chapter, and their ancient Terminator armour enables them to carry out the extremely dangerous task of searching the hulks. Now, humans have explored extensively in the 41st millennium, and they have found orcs to inhabit every corner of the galaxy, and this seems unlikely to change now or in the future. The orcs are not a race of reason, or diplomacy, or even needs. They exist as a genetically engineered creation of instinct and a DNA-coded sense of being. They spread across the galaxy more like a plague than conquerors. This plague of war is often referred to as the Warg. Orc conflicts usually will remain localised to their own planets, or objectively speaking, small raids to worlds inhabited by other races or other orc or pirate-like raids on passing ships. Again, as with most things that orcs do, there's usually not a grand plan here, so don't overthink it. A wag, though, is a different happening altogether. When numbers of orcs reach a critical mass, they feel a need to migrate to form a crusade of apocalyptic aggression that will sweep through a region, destroying anything in its path. Numbers of orcs are beyond estimation, then they'll swarm through a segmentum of space exterminating everything in their path. You could liken this to a locust plague or a viral pandemic until it eventually burns itself out. A wag also refers to a psychic field that affects orc psyche. This is, again, as with all things orc, an instinctive state, enabling them to make simple observations of understanding. This applies to everything from designation of seniority, which again, don't overthink that, it's usually more akin to who is just bigger and therefore more right. All orcs generate this dull psychic field by default. It binds them together and helps their ramshackle culture function. The more orcs that are present, the stronger this shared psychic field becomes, and this is amplified through sheer numbers, or if they say are enjoying a really good bit of battle and smashing their enemies' faces in. The warg helps drive them, and you could think of it as being akin to momentum, where past a point is just going to increase. A warg can begin on a small scale, sometimes as a small individual who may have some vision of great carnage and feel inspired to share with others by smashing their heads in until they get it. Or if he's imbued with a sense of tech skill, maybe he's going to create some giant gargant war machine that gets the blood and hype of his fellow orcs running high. The rumours of war and coming carnage spread like wildfire through the orcs, only exacerbating this sense of warg. An orc warboss, who is simply a big powerful orc in command of his tribe, will usually rise to their aspired position through just basically beating the hell out of all around them, until fellow orcs just get it that he's the biggest and the strongest. His decisions will be enforced by a ruling caste of orcs known as knobs, and these are again a bigger than normal orc, who will surely remind those below them of the fact at every opportunity, with some casual violence. A war boss in a time of warg will assert himself through unsurprisingly more savage, senseless violence towards his fellow orcs. When a war boss has created enough blunt trauma to be recognised as a powerful boss, he'll then be deemed an orc warlord. As his status spreads, more and more clans will come under his control, growing an unrelenting green mass of aggression. The mechs and brain boys will build ever more outlandish creations absurd in their brutality and genius in their creativity. Vicious war machines belching smoke and oil, poisonous vapours, acrid smoke, mobile fortresses, titanic war engines created from basically random scrap metal and abandoned, twisted, now cannibalised war engines. 
As the war boss grows ever stronger toward becoming the warlord, he will subsume his challenger's armies, with many of the orcs now seeking the sense of warg with a bloodthirsty insanity. Mech boys raise towers of warg and gargants will start to be seen. Gargants are the equivalent of imperial titans and so represent a world-ending level of firepower. These gargants are idols or seen as avatars to the orc race as manifestations of their gods Gork and Mork. They are merciless weapon assemblies of sheer destruction. Gargants form no standard pattern of design as does barely anything in the orc way of creation. They are instead a random collection of parts and combinations of cannibalized war machines. And this excitable and chaotic nature of these builds makes their weapon systems unreliable. Their whole design is haphazard and probably about as dangerous to the crew as to their targets on their battlefield. A clear difference between most Orc War machinery and other races in the galaxy is they don't utilize guidance systems commonly. They also carry large crews of Orc and the lower smaller race of Gretchen. They operate these war machines as a team, passing down orders as you might imagine a steamship of say the 19th century, calling down orders to the engine room and so on. Gretchens are significantly physically smaller than orcs and so they're used to repair systems on the go by crawling into tight spaces. Gargants are usually weaker in terms of armour compared to Imperial Titans and relatively shorter range of weaponry, however they're still difficult to destroy because of the compacted, dense nature of their construction. There is one rarer variety above a normal Gargant known aptly as a Mega Gargant. And this is essentially a mobile fortress running on tracks. Imperial tales tell of orcs laying siege to cities, spending even as long as 18 months to construct these colossal machines of war. Returning to the apocalyptic warg, the continual swelling of orc mobs starts to reach a critical mass. Ships and transport vessels are smashed together and the orc armies reach a point of no return. This wave of violence now comes crashing down as the orc armies overflow with bloodlust, descending into battles that consume entire worlds. The Gargan idols further trigger the instinctive drives of the orc clans and tribes who would do anything to outdo each other's destructive capabilities. At some point, this wave of fury and raging violence reaches its boiling point and the orcs begin to gather their great warg army. The ground shaking under the weight of tracked vehicles and striding walkers. The skies turn black from flyers, belching out blackened exhausts, and their ragged banners of brutality raising high atop these rusting, illogical contraptions of war. Orc wargs are very decentralized and have very little true coherency, even with a powerful war boss or warlord overseeing things. Various fragmented factions will exist in a warg, cults of speed for example, whose principle is to go fast. Essentially speed freaks who love the thunderous roar of an engine, and if they can shoot some guns at the same time, all the better. Probably driving over and crushing some of their own kind in the process. Storm boys are elite shock troops who strap huge rockets on their back to make sure they're first into battle, charging with no thought much to the consequences. And this is actually frowned upon by many orcs as they prefer to charge in under their own feet to get physically into the battle. Still, seeing a Storm Boy's volatile rocket pack malfunction go spinning off into an exploding disaster, certainly killing the pilot in the process, is great entertainment for the comrades on the ground. And then of course you've got the Mad Boys, these are orcs overwhelmed by the psychic energy of Warg, and they also can occur when clans of orcs inhabit a planet and have to develop their own technology over generations of spawned orcs. Either way, Mad Boys don't coexist well with their kin, they're essentially best described as feral, which is saying something by orc standards. These feral crazed orcs are also known as nutters, and they're grouped together into squads who will either be a secret tool to success when unleashed on the enemy, or a hindrance when they accidentally slaughter any fellow orcs they happen upon. Once combat begins, mad boys can still be some of the most savage fighters to an orc foe or fellow orc alike, ripping them to pieces. Still, they're just as likely to sit in a whimpering huddle, unable to move overwhelmed by psychic confusion. No orc can tell exactly how they're going to behave and making them an unpredictable and extremely dangerous force to bring onto the battlefield. Along with their crudely smashed together spaceships and space hulk infestations, orcs have even been reported to convert asteroids into massive space fortresses known as the uncreatively titled rocks. The orc species is one of the most adept at making the best of their surrounding materials and this is the genius and danger of their design. The old ones created the orcs with only two things in mind, 
making them deadly and to make them near impossible to exterminate. Orcs are a plague upon the galaxy to be sure, but not because of their skill in battle or because they spread insidious ideologies, but simply because they're so difficult to truly eradicate. Humanity, for all of its technology and experience, often must resort to planetary exterminatus to be truly sure of destroying an orc infestation. Orcs defeat their enemies by either overwhelming them or wearing them down to a point of collapse through continuous losses in personnel and materials, simply by attrition. Orcs operate from a sheer antithesis of ordinary warfare. Usually any force will seek out decisive victories, utilising minimal resources and seeking to limit casualties. Orcs, on the other hand, seek no limitation in casualties or resource management. They have no control over this, but to burn as hard and as fast as possible. And even when defeated, they will return to grind down whatever crumbling defences remain of their enemy. Now there are many individual stories and tales of orc warlords and bosses, as there are within the Imperium and its various leaders, captains and general history. In orc culture and history, you can't speak of the orcs without mentoring the warlord Garskull Mag or Thraka. He's an orc warlord of the Goth clan and is an immense symbol of everything orc. Now despite orcs being generally an anonymous mass of anarchy, he stands out as a powerful leader. He's commanded multiple campaigns and crushed most, if not all, in his sights, be they Imperial, Eldar or Chaos, smashed the metal skulls of the Necron into brittle scrap. He has influence above that of any ordinary Orc Warlord and is often described as a prophet of their gods. He travels the galaxy subjugating, slaughtering and burning the enemies of the Orc. His vision is to wage a warg so immense as to summon the Orc gods out of the Immaterium and into the physical realm, and he extends their will. But his beginnings were nothing of note, just another orc bashing in other orc's brains to climb up the ranks, and originating on a planet known as Urk, originally Urkles, founded by humans during the Dark Age of Technology. Humanity prospered here, rich in mineral wealth, and with easy warp tides flowing for space travel, it was an excellent trade hub. Lights and noise attract attention. Resources make good mechs, and the orcs would become aware. Attacking with a voracious assault, the orcs would raise the planet before riding back into the warp tides. As with nearly all orc assaults, the departure is not as clean as it appears to be. They'd leave behind fungal spores, and the orcs would return in time. Other species would periodically form outposts on the planet. Sometimes the orcs would rise up, other times not. Sometimes they'd be destroyed, sometimes not. It wouldn't be until the Great Crusade of Mankind, though, that any humans would return here in numbers. The Dark Angel Space Marine Legion would lay claim to the world, and for 2,000 years humanity would build, mine, and establish a functioning order on the reinstated world of Urkles. That was until around the 32nd millennium, when a great orc warg swept through the system. Humans were overwhelmed again and evacuated, fleeing into the warp. But its tides destabilised, and Urkles would be cut off and not easily reached by outside influence again for about 8,000 years. The Orc tribes, however, remained, battling one another and fighting over the human ruins that remained. A state of genuine attrition was reached with various warbands fighting over ever-diminishing resources, none of them able to unite under a single leader. Then came Gazgol. One thing the Imperium had learned about the Orcs, though, was that their wargs could be quashed if detected early enough. The Imperium would begin to deploy observation posts so as to best detect and monitor Orc numbers and activity. And the Dark Angels monitored this as well as they routinely monitored human populations for potential recruiting planets. After the warp tides had calmed, the Dark Angels were able to establish one such outpost on Urk so as to monitor this well-occupied Orc planet. The Orcs, however, desperate for any loot and resources, managed to discover this observation post and it was quickly overrun. At this time, Garsgul was just a Goth's trooper in a warband, and during the frenzy to claim the base, he would be shot in the head by a bolter shell, a devastating injury that would shatter his skull and pulp a section of his brain. Staggering back to his feet with immense toughness, he drew the respect of orcs around him, especially Goths. 
Despite being a physical wreck, staggering and stumbling, his blood and brain spilling out into his own hands, they eventually found their way to a dock, who would perform what I guess orcs deemed to be an operation. As is often the way with orcs, this was less a repair and more an improvement, an augmentation, and probably a bit of an experiment. Gazgill found that his skull and brain were now strengthened with bionics, squig sinew and adamantium plating. These physical alterations were great to be sure, but nothing compared to the vision he would see awakening from this augmentation. He would see a vision from Gork and Mork themselves to lead orcs on the greatest, most destructive and carnage reaping warg that there had ever been. It was his sole core belief that he had been in direct contact with his gods and that he was the chosen leader and the executor of their commands. That or his brain got pulped by a bolt gun round through the skull. Either way, his purpose was clear and his resolve strengthened. And as is often the way in orc culture, the whys and wherefores are not really relevant. It's the actions that count and Gazgul's actions would be notable. Orc warlords began to fall immediately under his crushing will. The Death Skull's warlord Dregmech, with Gazgul barely minutes out of his surgery, the Death Skull's warlord would attack, unleashing a bullet storm that left Gazgul untouched. By perhaps godly intervention, Dregmech could not believe his eyes as Gazgul would stride forward, beating him into a bloody pulp, headbutting and smashing him to pieces as his mobs looked on. Some getting carried away in the violence and even cheering Gazgul on, roaring from his victory, Gazgul declared himself the prophet of Gork and Mork, and that this was his mere beginning. The word of Gazgul's brutality and power spread fast, and orcs flocked to join a band with a sense of purpose and direction, to be something more than the pitiful squabbling and clamouring for scraps that they'd become. The tales of a new boss touched by the gods with a vision for war was very appealing. His further battles with the evil suns and bad moons would be no less aggressive, but required more tactical sense, using burning fuels to shield his troops' approach or outwitting warlords through their sense of pride for their disposition, he was placed as an inevitable leader. His subjugation of other warlords continued until he stood poised to do something no other orc warlord had done in 8,000 years, unite the tribes on the planet of Urk. His domination of the planet was unquestioned but Gazgul had set his sights far beyond bringing together the orcs inhabiting his world. His words drove the orcs to their purpose, the warg beginning to form. Their energy attracting others, void ships began to arrive. For the first time in centuries, mechs worked together, building machines they never could have imagined previously. But now with the energy and the power of the warg, it all just worked. It was a miracle. The orc energies flowed as they riveted together giant battle fortresses and mechs. Everything that occurred was the will of Gork and Mork, and Gazgul would declare every passing day, every achievement, every new ship arriving proved their quest was divine. Some of the orcs they were wondering how they were going to get so many of the orcs off the planet, they didn't have very many flyers and no large ships to transport and begin their war. Gazgul quickly silenced them. A solution would present itself. It was the will of Gork and Mork. Days later, the ever unpredictable tides of the Immaterium would shift again, and that rarest of occurrences would happen. A gigantic ancient space hulk would emerge from the warp. Gaskell ordered tractor cannons and harpoon rockets on the few spacecraft that they had to secure the hulk. They couldn't guess as to how long before the warp would swallow the ancient ship, even with them holding it in place, and they needed to work fast. The orcs rushed to assist in mech construction. They crafted as many transports and war machines as possible. Once they deemed enough was enough, they crammed as many orcs into every possible space and set off. This great exodus from their backwater planet filled the skies, not without many mid-air collisions and engine failures as well to be sure. Crashing into the Space Hulk's outer hull, some managed to make their way inside, some straight on ploughed into the vessel, and those with more sense sought out landing positions. The orcs soon discovered that they weren't alone on the Space Hulk, with wave after wave of demons spilling out of its corridors. Battling through the horrors, Gazgul and his band fought through to the centre of the Hulk, where they found merged and jumbled by the warp was the ship, the Dominion. This was the vessel the humans had attempted to flee from the planet on some several thousand years ago, and seemingly it had been swallowed by the warp, its human occupants devoured by the demons as they lay trapped in their vessel. 
The void rift that was spilling demons had to be closed, but Gazgul, after ordering his orcs to fire everything they had, was furious to discover it had no effect. His own weapon, even his own power claw, eventually with a massive headbutt and a flash of green light, that did the job, closing the demonic portal. It seems likely his latent psychic energy was what effected this in closing, but for the orcs observing, it was only further imbued their belief that this warlord was a force like no other. Gazgul now named his conquered space hulk the orc warship World Killer. The ship would drift on for an undetermined period of time, in which the orcs would explore, loot and generally rip off whatever they could find on board, cannibalising the ship and using its materials to craft ever more powerful mechs and weapons. They appropriated everything they could lay their hands on and built everything they could lend their hands to. The best scrap would often lead to infighting and rivalry, all a positive thing for the orcs to keep their tensions and blood up. It would not be a quiet period though, travelling through the warp in such an unsecure vessel is dangerous and many times they'd be assaulted by further demonic incursions. And these assaults only further heightened the orcs warg until the entire space hulk was seething with orc energies. The Space Hulk jolted and huge tremors swept across the ship. The World Killer had shifted back into real space. Imperium records date the emergence of the Space Hulk in the year 941M41. They were headed for the core planet of the star system, an Imperial world aptly named Armageddon. An industrial hive planet where thousands of years of extensive industry had left it a barren wasteland with a totally collapsed ecosystem. Humans only survived in the concentrated hive cities that stood kilometres tall, and also in the Imperial military facilities stationed there. Food needed to be imported off-world and no life existed outside of the hives. It contained multiple vast manufactorums vital to munition supplies for the Astra Militarium but with one of the most savage and relentless wargs ever seen headed straight for them, it seemed like nothing was going to be able to stop World Killer and its crew. The ship would head straight for the planet without stopping. The plan? There wasn't a plan. They would crash straight into the planet. Gaskell was literally on a collision course with his destiny. Caught off guard, nearby Imperial fleets and the planet's defences did what they could to slow the assault, but this only chipped away at the massive Space Hulk that approached. Taking minimal effective damage, it ploughed straight into the planet's polluted atmosphere, crashing with obvious devastation onto its surface. Even though many thousands of orcs would be turned to ashes on impact, this was but a tiny percentage of their total force. To the survivors, Gazgul seized this opportunity. It is the will of Gork and Mork that we survive, he would proclaim. The orcs now twice as pumped up, having survived their world-ending crash into the planet, would be a force none would wish to reckon with, and Gazgul quickly divided his massive army into five hordes, with leaders that he'd subdued and recruited to his cause back on Urk. They'd now stepped forth, millions of orc, but one voice. The human defenders weren't prepared for this. They had many forces, war gear and munitions, but the sheer scale of the violence and ferocity they were met with was of nothing they'd dreamt of in their worst nightmares, which in the 41st millennium is certainly saying something. This was not an ordinary orc warg. This was Garsgård Thracker's warg. The orcs showed expectedly no mercy at any instance, and they defeated the humans on the wastelands with their speeders and battle wagons, ruined enemy supply lines and cut down anything that moved and they quickly turned their attention to structures that they had never seen before. These hive cities, taller than mountains, industry and engineering on an imperial scale. The mechs stood in awe. So much scrap, they would have murmured. At the first hive they encountered, despite the Imperium putting up a formidable defence at Hive Volcanus, heavily fortified, this would take all of Garsgill's cunning. He had his gargans, but he wanted to take this city with orcs on the ground, scorching, burning and reaping through the trenches. The orcs would smash, crush and break this city. Using his visionary choices of units, Gazgul crushed the human defences quickly and on breaking the gates, unleashing a wave of infantry. His will was executed perfectly, a tall order for an orc warg. Desperate humans resorted to guerrilla warfare, but despite much heroism, the orcs swept through like a plague, slaughtering and enslaving its occupants. 
Its manifact dorms were quickly converted to orc workshops. Human slaves turned to stripping their own city for every scrap of resource that could be used to fashion more orc mechs. Now on the planet of Armageddon, one human stood out from the general perception of the orcs as a weak and puny race, Commissar Sebastian Yarrick. He drew unusual respect from the orcs, not least because he wore goth colours of the black and red, but also sporting an augmented power claw and bionic eye. This was a human the orcs could get on board with. Even more so when they learned from enslaved humans that they often feared Yarrick as much as they feared their other enemies. Yarrick known for shooting disobeying soldiers out of hand. Orcs upon seeing him in battle though were often disappointed to see he wasn't quite as big as they'd imagined he was only a human sized figure. Oh well, he was an uncompromising warrior nonetheless. Yarrick was the man credited with withstanding the Orc assault on Hive Hades for a significant period of time. This assault brought the Armageddon War to a new level of brutality. The Orcs had already sacked two Hive cities, and Hades stood next in line. The Imperium, in desperation, would launch virus bombs, devices not used since the time of heresy against the Orcs, and even though hundreds of thousands of Orcs would perish, it wasn't enough. Garsgol wanted Hades, and he would direct the assault himself. He tried everything he could think of, growing ever more frustrated all the time. But all his traditional assaults would fail time and time again. Eventually, he summoned his weird boys to use their wag consumed minds to blast a psychic storm at the hive. Consumed by madness, the human defenders fell apart, but still the humans couldn't be defeated. The orc flyers were ripped apart by anti-aircraft fire, tunnel fighters cut their orcs trying to advance underground to pieces, and human suicide assault squads took down the immense orc gargants. All this would be Commissar Yarrick's doing. Gazgol by now had become fixated and obsessed with bringing down Hive Hades, his vision and judgement clouded by the frustration and needing to bring it down. While still battling this bitter assault, he would direct an orc horde to assault another Hive city, Acheron, perhaps in the hope to divert resources away or gain a victory and rally his troops to greater energy. But then, the worst possible development for the orcs. Orbital bombs rained from the sky as roaring space marine thunderhawks would sweep down into the planet. The blood angels, ultramarines and salamanders. The emperor's chosen warriors were here to defend Armageddon. Gazgul was still so blinded by fury in his efforts to defeat Yarrick and Hades he was unable to think with clarity enough to counter the arriving space marines. He would throw everything he had to take down his obsession, breaking in the blast doors of Hades in a final rampage. The Space Marines would be too late to save Hive Hades, its citizens massacred. With Gazgul's numbers now though severely depleted and loosely scattered across the planet, he consolidated his last reinforcements to a new Hive, Tartarus. The planet stood at a crossroads, even with the arrival of the Space Marines. They would deploy even as the Orcs began their assault with mechs, stompers and even Gorkonauts. The battle though was not in the orcs' favour, but then Gazgul himself arrived. The orcs could taste things were turning for them, but then just as quickly as he arrived, he'd gone. Chatter spread quickly through the orcs that the war boss had fallen, they began to waver to break, and the Imperium crushed the remaining orcs, driving them from Armageddon. But the orcs thinking Gazgul had fallen in battle was not so. Gazgol was not slain, but he did disappear from the battlefield. Rumours spread that the Hand of Gork had plucked him from the battlefield, and his detractors would say fled, usually to be met with a swift headbutt from a nearby orc putting them in their place. However, it did happen. Gazgol had escaped. After Armageddon, Gazgol did not rest. As with most orcs, defeat is not really a thing, it's just a stumble, a setback, a chance to have another go. This was the beginning for him in his larger journey, a plan of Gork and Mork. Yarrick recommended the Imperium hunt down this brutal war boss and eliminate him once and for all, but the Imperium assumed him dead or defeated and didn't want to spend the resources or time to locate an orc they were sure that that was the last they'd see of. This was a grave error of judgement, as is often the case with most things in the Imperium. To the Imperium's mind, his warg had failed, 
and therefore, even if he did survive, orcs would not look upon him for leadership with his energy deflated. After losing a battle, while orcs will happily try try again, they'll often topple their leader as is their natural order of things. But not so with Gazgul. While he may have had to defeat several challengers in brutal fashion after he regrouped with various orc tribes to remind them just who he was, he would begin gaining new followers again. Curiously for an orc, not just with his actions, but with his words. To him, the invasion of Armageddon had been a starting point, a testing of the enemy to find their strengths and their weaknesses, a large-scale intelligence gathering, orc-style, leaving millions dead and burning cities in its wake. And in this, they gained much useful information. Now Gazgul knew about Imperium strategies. He would regroup, rebuild, and restore his prophetic warg. He would reveal to his fellow orcs, in order to destroy your enemy, you must know him. To the orcs, this is about as profound as it gets, and their spirits would reignite. The second coming of Gazgul Thraka was only a matter of time.